Good evening. Buenas noches, everybody. Welcome to day two on week two of the semester. We're going to continue talking about the, chap the concepts of chapter one, and hopefully we will finish all the concepts of chapter one. The first thing that we are going to tackle is just a brief review of if we have mathematical operations with significant figures, how do we report those significant figures? We learned last time that when it comes to significant figures and we are doing addition and subtraction, we're going to pay attention to the decimal places that we have in our particular number. We did problem one in which we were, sub we were adding 25.6 plus 36.27. So even though our calculator display, you can see it in the corner, which is 61.89, then since the smallest of the two decimal places illustrated in our measurements was one decimal place, we rounded to one decimal place. Let's do problem two as a review, and I need you guys to write it in the chat. In problem number two, we are subtracting, okay? So I need somebody at home with a calculator, write in the chat the calculator display for subtracting 1.337 minus 87.5128. But it has to be a negative number, correct? Exactly, a negative number. So our calculator display is negative 86.1758. But when we look at the digits that we have, this has three decimal places. This has four decimal places. So let's put, how many decimal places do we need to round? Great, I already see the answer here. Excellent job, you guys. So based on the decimal places, we need to express this as negative 86.176. Great job. A question on them, and just to refresh my memory, and this is because we're doing for math, um, math for addition and subtraction, we're doing the least um, amount of sig figs. No, decimal places. Decimal, least amount of decimal places. Yes. Okay. And remember that no decimal places, so a whole number, okay, could be, because sometimes students are like, but this number has no decimal places. I'm like, exactly, no decimal places is still a digit. So. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say that you guys are adding, let me just do this example really quick. Let's say that you do 17 plus 1.83 plus 2.5. Okay, we're adding all three of them. What is my calculator display, you guys? Let's just put it in the chat. If I take these three numbers and I add them, 17, 1.83, and 2.5. What is the calculator display? 21.33, okay? Now, when we look at the digits, zero decimal places, two decimal places, one decimal place. This means, great job, Maria, exactly. 17, because it has no decimal places, we round this to no decimal places. So it will be 21. You know okay. what kind of helps me with that is just kind of drawing a line where the least amount of decimal places are. When I add them, I kind of stack each other up instead of kind of keeping horizontal. That makes mm -hmm. any sense. Yeah. Good, that's a good strategy. I like that, Aaron. Thank you. That's awesome. That's another way to look at it. So again, if you wanna try that strategy that Aaron just mentioned, go ahead and do that. 
just stack them. So what Aaron, Aaron, what you're saying is that you do this. You say 17 and then you do 1.83 and then you do 2.5. Yeah, and then right. I just draw the line where the seven ends because that's the least amount of decimal places. Great job. Excellent. So if that helps anybody, hey, this is um you put the decimal place here, but then you underline down here also, Aaron. No, I just kind of draw draw the line all the way down straight through so I know okay. where to round from. So since like if I were to add it, it would be uh, 21.33, right? If you add it, uh -huh. I know that I'll put an arrow from the one because that's where the line splits between the one and the three. And I'll put an arrow right under it where that number would round. I, I kind of okay. have to show it visually. It's kind of hard explaining it, but. No, 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 but it makes sense to me. So it's kind of like you're telling yourself, hey, because this is going to determine my uh decimal my decimal places right it's kind of mm. like if i use my highlighter tool it's like again with underlines but you're like focusing in that area mm -hmm. you're saying okay the digits up to this point are the ones that count again i'm using it a highlighter tool here but it's it's kind of like the same idea yeah then Let's say that we have multiplication or division and we did number three, okay? So when it comes to multiplication and division, we need to remember the number of sig figs in our measurement, okay? So as you can see in number three, two sig figs, then four sig figs. Oh, so we have to round to two sig figs. Let's try number four. So take a moment, for those of you that have a calculator at home, write in the chat what is the calculator display when you have 7.331 divided by 12.42. Thank you guys. So we see 0 0.59025764.9. That's your calculator display. But when we look at the digits, we say, wait a minute. This has four sig figs. This has four sig figs. So we need to round to four sig figs. Okay? So when we're paying attention to our sig figs, this is significant, this is significant, this is significant, this is significant. So the two, let's look at what is next to it. There's a five. Excellent job. Thank you, Elizabeth. That is the final answer. Our final answer here will be 0 0.5903, okay? Put a one in the chat if, again, addition and subtraction by itself. And multiplication and division by itself makes sense to you. You can write the answer, round it to the correct number of six things. Love to see those ones. Great, great, great. Now, what happens when we have a combo? Meaning now, if I have parentheses, exponents, and all that kind of stuff, how do I deal with significant figures? Well, this is the way that we tackle them. So as an example, I'm going to do problem five for you guys, okay? So let me transfer problem five. So in problem five, we see that we have something inside of the parentheses and something outside of the parentheses, okay? So let me just transfer it. I write, 22.5285 plus 22.14, close the parentheses, divided by 4.266, okay? Now, there are rules to order of operation, and that is called PEMDAS rules. In PEMDAS rule, it tells you that you have to do whatever is inside the parentheses first. Then you proceed to do whatever is outside of the parentheses, okay? So the first thing that we're going to do is the addition because that's what is inside of the parentheses. 
So we're going to take those two values and we're going to add them. Let's put on the chat. What is the result from that? So when you add 22.5285 plus 22.14, what's the answer? Thank you guys. So that is 44.6685. Now, inside the parentheses, we did addition. So what am I technically looking at? So if I was about to, uh, uh, you know, just apply significant rules to that portion, what am I really looking at? Sig figs or decimal places? Great job, decimal places. So technically, when I'm paying attention to these decimal places, I have to tell myself, even though in problems like this, I have to use all of my values, I'm going to highlight the number of decimal places that correspond to the rule coming out of the parentheses. Put a one in the chat if that makes sense. Why is it that I highlighted up to the 66? Awesome. Now, you guys have to use all of the numbers. So when you're doing this in my first exam, you're going to use 44.6685. You're going to do that. And you're going to divide it by 4.266. I don't want you guys to round yet. You're gonna use all of your numbers, okay? So the number that came out of a parentheses, I like to think about it like it is now in a new stage, okay? It's in a new room. And it's kind of like when you are at home, you learn things at home. And when you are at school, you bring all of you to school, okay? So here, the 44.6685 bring all of it to the next stage, which is now division. So I'm going to take 44.6685 and divide it by 4.266. What is going to be the answer out of that division? Thank you guys. 10.4708158. Now, who determines my final answer sig figs is my last operation. And my last operation here is division, okay? So how many sig figs do I have in the second number? How many? Let's put it in the chat. Great job. This has four sig figs. The first value, even though there are six, I see it, there's six, but I only highlighted the number that came out of the rules from the parentheses. So how many did I highlight? Also four. So you know what that means, you guys? Because I highlighted four, but I also have four. I'm going to round to four sig figs. So when I round this value to four six fix, what is my final answer? Let's put it in the chat. Thank you, Vanessa. 10.47, that's my final answer, okay? Let's try a problem. This is going to be very similar. I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to do this. You have subtraction followed by multiplication. So all of the steps that we did in the first problem, we're going to apply it to this one. So again, I'm gonna give you two minutes to solve this problem. We will go over it.
Great, I already see answers here. Let's see how we determine this one. Let's go step by step. So this is the equation that I, we need to solve. Whoa, what happened to this? Let me see, is this connected? There you go. Now we can see my markings. So we do 53.4 minus 10.77. This is 42.63. Put a one in the chat if you found that from the parentheses. Excellent. Now I'm going to highlight. Let's put on the chat, up to what digit am I highlighting? Based on the rules coming out of the parentheses. Excellent job. Up to the six, up to the first decimal place. For those of you that are like, wait, you lost me. I need the markings. One decimal place. Two decimal places why am i looking at decimal places because i'm subtracting so i highlight up to the first decimal place meaning up to the point six now i'm going to take all of the numbers that 42.63 and i'm going to multiply times 0.935 okay I get 39.85905. Put a one in the chat if that's the final result that you got. Okay. Excellent. Now I ask myself, okay, what is the last operation that I'm doing? Well, if we look closely, we are doing multiplication. So now I have to look at the six in this new realm. Thank you, Katie, exactly. This is three six figs. How many did I highlight? Three six figs. So what am I rounding to? What am I rounding to? Three six. Excellent. So that's why the final answer, and I know that people put answers, before, but the correct one for this type of problem is going to be 39.9. Great question. What if the sig figs don't match? Well, you do it to the lowest sig fig. So let's say that um, when it comes to coming out of the parentheses, let's say that what we highlighted is only two sig figs, and then you're multiplying by three, then because the highlighted is two, then you know you show it as two sig figs. Or if you're multiplying by two sig figs, but you highlighted three, again, because our last operation is multiplication or division, is going to be determined by the lowest number of sig figs, okay? Remember that sig figs is all about measurements, okay? So since they are measurements and it's all attached to the resolution of your measurement, that's why it's so important to keep track of them, okay? Now, let's determine what happens when we have and understand that even though you will see me erasing, all this work is going to be there. I'm not erasing it and it's lost. Understand that all of this is going to be on the notes once I post them, okay? So for example, this is just a different slide. Let me let me show you what guys what I mean, because I know that sometimes students are like, oh my God, I didn't copy it. But let me show you that is still there. Because even though we did this, look, uh, doo -doo -doo, it's here. 
So you saw me erase it, but it's because that is a different copy of the slide. It's still here. This is just the erased one, okay? So know that your notes are there. Let's go over number six. What happened if now we have multiplication and division inside the parentheses, but then outside the parentheses, we have addition and subtraction, okay? Well, let's go over number six. So when it comes to number six, we have to find out what is the result when we take 8.489 times 7.13 plus 6.5. We're going to do very similar to what we did. We're going to do the multiplication first. 8.489 por 7.13. Coming out of the parentheses, I hope that you guys get 60.52657. I hope that people get that. Great. Inside of the parentheses, I need to find out how many digits I'm going to highlight. Remember that here, I need to go by sig figs because I'm multiplying inside of the parentheses. Excellent job. Three sig figs. This is three sig figs. This is four sig figs. So I'm going to highlight three sig figs up to here. Now I take all of the numbers. I'm going to add. To 6.5, all of these digits. So when I do all of those digits plus 6.5, I get the following number 67.02657. Okay. So this goes back to the question that was in there. Okay. In the chat. What happened when they don't match? Oh no, but this one in a way it matches. Let's deal with this though. I'll give you one that doesn't match so we can see it. In this one, it matches again. This is because in the last operation is addition. We say, hey, this is one decimal place. This is one decimal place. So I need to round to one decimal place. That's why the final answer is 67.0. Okay. Put a two in the chat. If the operations here made sense, we're going to do a problem now to practice. To make sure that everybody gets this. In the exam, I always put one problem like this. In the textbook, you guys are not going to find problems like this because in the textbook is just multiplication, just division, just addition, just subtraction. So this is just kicking it up a notch, okay? Let's do the following. So let's do the following problem, okay? I'm going to give you guys a few minutes and we will go over it. Let me give you guys a minute, put it in the calculator. Oh, I already see answers in the chat. I like to see that. Let's get started with this.
I already start seeing answers. Let's determine. There you go. Let's continue. So let's divide those two numbers, 0. 0.734. And we're going to divide it by 0. 0.12. This is my calculator display. 6.11 and a whole bunch of sixes. There's five of them. Okay. Out of the parentheses, I need to highlight the number of sig figs that is the least number of sig figs compared to what is coming out of the parentheses. This has three sig figs. This has two sig figs. So how many sig figs am I going to highlight? How many? Only two. Great job. So up to here. Now, when it comes to doing the next process, I have to tell myself, okay, let me underline them because it's kind of like, it's just this one and this one because it kind of looks like the second one is also there, but it's not. I'm going to take all of the digits and subtract them from 3.721 minus 3.721. I get this calculator display, 2.3956, all of the numbers there. So the last thing that I'm doing here is subtraction. So now I have to compare how many decimal places I highlighted versus the three decimal places that are there, right? So, this is three decimal places, but how many did I highlight? Only one decimal place. So, what I need to round to is to one decimal place. Exactly. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's why you have the 2.4 as your final answer. Questions, when you have an operation inside of parentheses and an operation outside of the parentheses. If you still have questions about this, please come to office hours. I'm more than happy to help. Since there are no questions, then we are going to, again, review the whole topic of conversion factors, okay? So we learned already how to do a metric to metric conversion and using definitions of metric US or US to do conversions, okay? So as you can see here, the top one is a metric to metric conversion. The bottom one is just a definition between US and metric conversion. So when we have metric to metric conversions, we use the number line. When you have metric US or US US, you use dimensional analysis. We have these examples from our in-class worksheet, okay? I'm going to do with you guys number one and number five. If you're a pro at this, hey, go ahead and do six and 10. And there's more problems in the in-class worksheet. Once we finish chapter one, I will be posting the answer key for chapter one. So you guys, if you practice at home, the rest of the problems, you can check your answers. So let's get started with the first one. Whenever we're doing unit conversions, and this is one of the reasons why, why I'm going to hand grade the pre-lab. For this class, with me as an instructor, if I give you a certain number of sig figs, your final answer needs to include that number of sig figs. So right now, take a moment. And let's determine the number of sig figs given in each of these values, okay? 
So take a moment, look at them. Marta, can I mute, mute you? Or you have a question? Yes, sorry, my internet crashed and I'm now I'm on my phone, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Number one, how many sick figs? Let's put it in the chat. Great, two sick figs. Six, five, and 10. How many sick figs do they have? They all have the same number of sick figs. Six, five, and 10. Great job, three sick figs. So what does that mean, you guys? That when we convert, we need to find in that answer, in this case, two sick figs, in the answer of all of the other ones, three sick figs. Because that's what is given to you. So let's get started with problem one and six. So you can see here that in problem number one, we are converting from M, which stands for meters, and we are converting this to MM, which stands for millimeters. So taking that into consideration, remember here, when we look at our number line, even though you see an M there, that is not meters, that stands for milli, okay? So this M is not meters, that M is uh, milli. So where in this number line does meter live? Thank you, Katie. In the basic unit. So meters lives here. Now, I'm given meters. I'm walking to millimeters. So what does this mean? I start right here. I'm walking here. What do I mean by walking? I'm going to take my decimal place and I'm going to move it. How many times? One, two, three times from left to right. So I look at my number, 0 0.30. I move that decimal place one time, two times, three times. And some of you will be like, oh, Dr. Luz, but you have a spot, but you don't have a digit. What do I do? I fill it up with a zero. The reason why I can fill it up with a zero is because the relationship of these is by tens. So whenever we move the decimal places and there's an open pocket, we're going to fill it up with a zero. Great. So at first, just like it was put in the chat, we're going to say, oh, this equals 300 millimeters. But then what's the problem with the digit 300? Does 300 have three sig figs? Or sorry, two sig figs, which is what we want. Exactly. 300 doesn't have two sig figs. So some of you may be like, oh, no problem, Dr. Luz. Let me put a decimal place right here. I'm done. If I put a decimal place right there, do I solve the problem? Excellent. Thank you, Katie. That is three sick figs. So we still have an issue because we don't have the number of sick figs that we need. So understand that we learned on Tuesday that there is a notation that we can utilize. Thank you, Kiyomi. Exactly. We can utilize scientific notation to express the number the way that is needed. So 300, when I put it in scientific notation, which is 3.0 times 10 to the two. Oh, my coefficient has two sig figs. Now I'm done. You don't have to convert things to scientific notation every time, you guys. It's only in very special cases, okay? But for now, take a moment. Change from grams to kilo. Let's make the conversion of 5.00 grams to kilograms and make sure that your answer 
has three sig figs. No, that's not three. Let's think about it. The zeros before the five are placeholder. They are just, they're just telling you that that's a number less than zero, but good idea. The zeros need to be there to tell you that it's just that that's not three six. You're in the right track though. Let's go through the problem together. Grams is a basic unit. So it's going to be here. Kilograms is right here. So we're moving that decimal place from here. One, two, three times from left to right. I agree with that. So when you do that, you will say, okay, this moves one time, two times, three times, and it's here. I have two pockets. How do I populate them? With zeros. So you can write this value as 0 0.00500. You can write it as 0 0.00500. Because the zeros after the five are significant, we need to keep them. Does it make sense now why we need to keep those, those zeros after the five? You can also transform this into scientific notation, you guys. You can say, okay, Dr. Luz, I'm just going to practice my scientific notation. This is 5.00 times 10 to the negative three. You could do that too. Great job, exactly. So all these three answers that we see here are correct. Questions on metric to metric conversions. Okay, just to clarify for this one too, for um, the, it follows the rule of zeros and that's why we're keeping all of them. Yes because those zeros are significant. So mm -hmm. they're important in the resolution of your, uh, of your measurement. Okay, thank you. Let's move to doing conversions when we have definitions. And I mentioned to you guys, if I gave you a table that has definitions, I'm expecting you guys to use it for the exam. So again, even though I mentioned it also in the study guide, I'm, when, when I write my exams, I'm assuming that you guys have this in handy. If there is an equality that is not here, then you will see it written in the problem. But anything that is in this table, you guys, I do not give you in exams because I'm assuming that you have it handy, okay? Now, let's deal with what if I am comparing two numbers and there's like metric US conversions. For example, 15.05 pounds, and I need to find that in grams. Let me warn you, please, even though it's tempting, don't find the equalities in the internet because I'm going to grade it based on what I'm assuming that you guys have or the tools that I give you. If you define, if you find an equality in the internet, um, you may be off a little bit, okay? so. Be mindful about that. So continue with this problem. I write what is given. Now my equality, which is this, I'm going to write it as a fraction. The reason why I write it as a fraction is because I wanna cancel the units that I start with and I'm going to obtain the units that I want. Here, I want grams. Since I'm trying to cancel pounds, we always cancel diagonally. So here, this is one pound. On the top, I'm going to write what that is equal to, 454 grams. So when I do 454 
times 15.0, I find that the calculator tells me that this is 6,810. And as you guys see, I gave you three sig figs. Now, is 6,810 three sig figs? Yes or no? Let's put it in the chat. Is the result that I wrote three sig figs? Come on, family. That is three sig figs. Let me review why 6,810 is three sig figs. Zeros at the end of a number and there is no decimal place. That's why we write it. That's why we say it is a placeholder. It's just telling you that you have a large amount. So those zeros is not that they're unimportant. It's just that they are placeholders telling you that you have a large number. If you, so the whole thing with scientific notation, um, I will be incorporating in the answer scientific notation and regular notation. I will tell you how to format scientific notation similar to what you guys see in the pre-lab. So, you know, don't be concerned with that. It will be in the options. It's just that right now with the promise that you guys have in the pre-lab, there is a wide variation of things. But for me, I, I tell you guys, like if you're entering this, this is how you enter it. So understand that if you choose to do it in scientific notation, you will be able to. So going back to the problem, six thousand eight hundred and ten is three sig figs because the zero is a placeholder. So in scientific notation, what would be this value in scientific notation? Thank you. 6.81 times 10 to the three, okay? So understand that the main thing here is three sig figs. Doesn't matter if it's regular notation or scientific. Let's take a moment and do problem 10. Fifty-four point nine fluid ounces, we need to change them to liters. One fluid ounce on top 0 0.02957 liters. When we round it to three sig figs, what's the final answer? All I'm doing is multiplying 54 times nine times 0 0.02957 divided by one. That's what I'm doing. Anyone? That's what I also got. 1.62. Any questions about conversions? So you got um, 1.62 because you're cutting it off at three sig figs. 
Correct. But initially the answer is like 1.623393. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So remember, we're rounding to the correct number of suffix. So even though the, the like you will guys will see it in the exam, it doesn't say round to the correct number of suffix. It says express your answer with the correct number of suffix. Remember in that term express means that you're going to round to the correct number of suffix. Since there are no questions, let's move on to the next topic, which is section 1.4. Here, we're going to understand mass, volume, and density. So when it comes to these concepts, mass, volume, and density, the definition of mass, this is the measure of the amount of matter that an object contains. Understand that mass and weight is not the same thing. Mass is amount of matter. Weight depends on the force that is equal to the gravitational pull. So whenever we say, oh, this is my weight, technically that's just the amount of mass you have. Because if you take technically your weight on earth and in the moon, since the gravitational pull is not the same, you wouldn't weigh the same, okay? Volume, on the other hand, is a measure of the quantity of space that is occupied by matter. And in the laboratory, we have different instruments, as you can see here, to measure volume. Graduated cylinder, syringes, burettes, pipettes, volumetric flasks. The reason why I bring up the idea of the different instruments is because in a few weeks, you guys will be picking up those um different, which I'm going to post it this weekend. I think they're going to start handing them the next week, uh, the lab kits for the labs in your home, okay? And you're going to see some of these instruments. Now, there is a property of matter that is known as density that compares those two things. Density can be given by the equation that you see illustrated here, where mass of a substance, when is divided by the volume of the substance, that is the density. Now, when it comes to density, we need to understand it conceptually and we can understand it mathematically. Now, we can see here that there are a series of substances sitting in a beaker. We have a cork, we have ice, we have water, we have aluminum, and we have lead. We can see here that since water is in the larger amount, we can compare based on density, the behaviors of the other substances around water. We can see that the cork and ice is less dense than water. And since they are less dense than water, that's why we see them floating. The aluminum and the lead are more dense than water. We can see it in the values. So since they are more dense than water, they're going to sink in the water, okay? Now, the property of density is actually utilized in cooking and it is utilized in everyday life even if uh, you haven't realized it, okay? Put a one in the chat if you have seen, if you're of legal drinking age, because I need to specify that I'm a mom, but I'm also a teacher. If you guys have ever seen shots that are different layers, anybody has seen that? Put a one in the chat. Or you have seen drinks in general that you're like, oh, look, that looks like a rainbow. Oh, there you go. The number of you guys have seen it. So when that happens, you guys, it's an application of density. Because think stack in a container based on their densities by the more dense substances being in the bottom. And as you go up in the container, the less denses are in the top. So let's say that we have here some typical materials that are found in liquid form. We have, you know, caro syrup, we have glycerin, we have vegetable oil, we have lamp oil, honey, baby oil, so on and so forth. I'm just going to select three of them. Let's say that I select, let me see. 
baby oil. Let me select things that are not um, interacting with one another. Uh, let's do rubbing alcohol. And let's do, let's say dark caro syrup or maple syrup, okay? If I need to stack them here, okay? Based on their densities, what's going to be the one in the bottom? Dark. Yep, the caro. That's what's going to be here because it's the most dense. What's the next substance that is going to stack on that? Great, the rubbing alcohol. Last one, what's going to be on top of that rubbing alcohol? Excellent, that baby oil. So as you can see here, if we have things stacked in a container, it's always going from less dense in the top to more dense in the bottom. I think naturally you can do this with juices. It is my understanding that if you have um, orange juice versus cranberry, you can see them in layers. Like even if you have, oh, the best example that I've seen that people are like, ooh, ah, is if you go and get agua frescas and usually because depending on how much sugar they have, when you ask them if you are mixing them, they stack very nicely. And people are like, oh, look, this is such a pretty drink. I was like, density, because of the sugar, is affecting the densities of it. Questions about density in terms of conceptually, do we understand what density means, how things stack or sink or float? Any questions? Since there are no questions, let's move on to talk about density in terms of math, okay? As I mentioned to you guys, when it comes to density, density is given by the equation mass divided by volume equals density. So if we rearrange with algebra this equation, we can isolate just the mass term. And we know that mass equals density times volume. We can also utilize this equation to isolate the volume term. V equals M over D. So this is equation one, equation two, equation three, okay? Let's look at the first example. A piece of tin, has a mass of 16.52 grams, a volume of 2.26 centimeters cubed. What is the density? Let's put in the chat, what is the equation that we're going to be using? Excellent, the first one. Density equals mass over volume, my mass is 16.52 grams. My volume is 2.26 gram, uh, centimeters cubed, sorry. So my units for density are usually grams per milliliters, but in this case, it's grams per centimeters cubed. So I take 16.52 divided by 2.26. I get a calculator display of 7.30973 four, five. This is where sig figs come back. How many sig figs do I need to round to? Let's put it in the chat. How many sig figs do I need to round to? Excellent, three. So the final answer for this is three or 7.31, okay? So again, as long as you understand, the equation is asking for this term based on density, you know the equations that you're applying to, you're good, okay? Let's do one more problem. What is the volume? In liters, specifically, if you're giving grams and densities, 
for a specific metal. So out of the three equations, which one are we using? One, two, or three? Great job. The third one. Volume equals mass over density. Three, two, five grams divided by 9.0 grams per centimeters cubed. So we do 325 divided by 9.0, okay? We find a calculator display that is 36.111111. How many sig figs in my final answer? Great, only two. So I found that this is 36 centimeters cubed, but you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, this is centimeters cubed. How is that related to, to liters? If we go to this table, centimeters cubed, is the same thing of saying milliliters. So when we go back, you have to tell yourself, wait, I get this. This is like saying 36 milliliters. And from milliliters, we know how to change it to liters. So metric to metric conversion, 36 milliliters is the same thing as saying 0 0.036 liters. So when it comes to these problems, please make sure that you read the question and you understand what unit I want you guys to express your answer. Any questions in density? Then let's move on to the next section, which is section 1.4. Now we're going to look at matter in terms of temperature, heat, and specific heat, okay? So let's understand the definitions of heat versus temperature. Heat is a form of energy and is measured in the unit of joules. Temperature, on the other hand, is the degree of hotness that, that substances have. And the unit of measurement includes Kelvin and the units that I have. Oops, it froze. Give me one second. This froze on me. Oh, now it's back. It's measured in the units of Kelvin. Celsius or Fahrenheit. In order to measure the temperature of a substance, we can utilize this instrument. And this instrument is called a thermometer. That's how we measure temperature. Now, this thermometer that I'm showing you guys here is illustrating the normal range for body temperature for humans. And you guys can see here that is between 96.8 and below 100.4. So maybe for those students that are going into the nursing programs, you realize it's like, okay, what does it mean to have a fever? Well, if your body temperature raises above that 100.4, that's what is considered a fever. If the body temperature keeps on increasing, 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 that's called hyperthermia. So at the level of hyperthermia, the body temperature has to increase above 105.8. And as you can see, that can lead to death. Body temperature can also decrease depending on the conditions, right? So if the body temperature decreases below 96.8, that is known as hypothermia. And it depends if it goes colder, colder, and colder, that can also, or it may also lead to death. One of the things that I want to illustrate in this thermometer is that to the right of the thermometer, we see the degrees in Fahrenheit, but to the left of the thermometer, we see the equivalent 
um, measurements in Celsius. So taking that into consideration is important to note that you guys need to know how to do temperature conversions, okay? So let me say something about temperature conversions. These are the equations that I typically utilize to teach temperature conversions. You can see that the first equation is for changing from Celsius to Kelvin. The second one is from Kelvin to Celsius. The third one is from Celsius to Fahrenheit. The fourth one is from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Now, my colleagues use the conversion 273.15. So let me modify my conversion to 273.15. Now, the numbers in these equations, because they are part of a definition, that's not how you count your sig figs. You're going to determine the number of sig figs in your final answer, depending on what you're given in the beginning. So let's try temperature conversions. Okay. So in the first one, we have the transition between Celsius to Fahrenheit. So if this is equation one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Which equation are we using? We're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Excellent, equation three. So for this problem, we're going to say, okay, I'm using equation three. I'm finding temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to take my temperature in Celsius. I'm going to multiply it times 1.80. And I'm going to add it to 32. Put a one in the chat if so far you understand what we're doing. Great. Then I'm going to say 16 times 1.80 plus 32, I find this is 60.8. Now, going back to our best friends, sig figs. How many sig figs in 16? 2 sig figs. What is the value that I need to round this to? to represent two sig figs. Excellent, 61 degrees Fahrenheit. That should be the final answer. Let me warn you, please use these rules when you're doing your pre-lab for this week. Please use those rules for the pre-lab this week. I will regrade it even if points are taken off because I want you guys to know these rules because this is how I'm going to grade you in the exam, okay? Professor? Yes, go ahead, this Katie. Is Katie, I'm so sorry. Um, I already did my two turns on the pre-lab and mm -hmm. I didn't have the 0.15 on there. I just had no. it as the 273. No problem. Okay. So on the highest of your two attempts, yeah. that's the one that I'm going to go ahead and regrade. Okay, okay. okay to make sure that it incorporates that. Okay, thank you. But if, let's say like, if there is any, you know, discrepancies, I'm going to just do comments. I'm not gonna take your points away. If, you know, if it's a, it was already graded, I'm just going to do comments. Or if you put it the right way, I'm going to award you the points. That sounds good, thank you. No problem. So again, when we're doing temperature conversions, all we have to do is, which equation do I need? Let me just find it right here. Remember, use 273.15 for whenever you're doing the Celsius to Kelvin or Kelvin to Celsius. And that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do 273.15, okay? But temperature conversions, again, it's just take the numbers, put them in the equations, okay? And then how you determine the number of sig figs is based on the measurement that you're given. Questions about temperature conversions?
So I want to at least go over specific heat. And basically on two, uh, yeah, I see you guys on Tuesday. On Tuesday next week, what I'm going to do with you guys is that I'm going to finish up one. We're going to do two really quick. And basically on Thursday, we're going to start chapter three, okay? So let's talk about specific heat. Let me warn you, in the textbook, there's a whole idea of a specific heat and equations and math and all that kind of stuff. I want to teach you guys about specific heat in terms of application. So I do. I, I want you guys to understand the concept of specific heat instead of doing all the math of specific heat, okay? So the definition of specific heat is, hey, this is the amount of heat that raises the temperature of exactly one gram of a substance by exactly one degree Celsius. Let me just translate that to English, okay? Specific heat is a value that is assigned to substances that we have around us. And then we can see in the table that I have here that these are the specific heats of different substances, okay? Now, in the kitchen, okay? Hopefully you guys have uh, done this, but if you haven't, we're gonna learn today. Let's say that we have something cooking. It could be boiling water for pasta. It could be that you're making sopa, is menudo, whatever it is. Let's say that you have food that is cooking in there. Put a one in the chat if you have ever left the spoon in there. Great, people have left the spoon. Now, let's look at the situation. What if you leave in there a metal spoon versus a wood spoon? As you guys can see in the notes here, oh, if we have both spoons, assuming that the spoons are the same mass, and we are applying the same heat because they're sitting in the same pot, we can see that the metal spoon is too hot compared to the wood one. Hmm, how can we rationalize that? Well, let's look at their specific heat. When we look closely at the specific heat, wood have a specific heat of 0 0.42 calories per gram per degree Celsius. Metal, Let's assume that it's an aluminum spoon, you guys. Let's just assume that. Let's, let's assume that the, the spoon that I am using is an aluminum spoon, okay? As you can see, the specific heat of that aluminum is 0 0.21 calories per gram per degree Celsius, because those are the units for specific heat. So, why is it that the metal spoon is too hot compared to the wood one? Because it has a lower specific heat. The trend is the lower the specific heat, the hotter that material is going to get compared to a material that has higher specific heat. So in this case, oh, my wood spoon has higher specific heat. So that is not going to be heated at the same rate as if I have something with a lower specific heat. A student several semesters ago gave me a great analogy. It's kind of like if you write these numbers in a number line and because 0.21 comes first, if you have like a flame, okay, growing and growing and growing, then that flame is going to hit the lower numbers before it reaches the top one, okay? Let's do one more application of specific heat. Maybe if you guys are like me, you love cooking shows. Put a two in the chat if you love cooking shows. That's my jam. I love cooking shows. It doesn't matter if it's uh, whatever baking champion or though baking is not part of my ministry. 
I, I like cooking dishes more. Chopped, all of those cooking shows. I love, yes, British baking show. Love it. I am so happy that my brother gave me the password to his Discovery Plus. <gasps> Nailed it. Yes. And they have nailed it in Spanish. It is awesome. So if you guys have a chance, you can check Nailed It in Spanish. And then Omar Chaparro is the host of it. It's super hilarious. Anyways, so in cooking shows, you might have seen that sometimes chefs are kind of frustrated and they're like, oh my God, this water is not boiling. I'm doing something wrong. What is happening? Well, let's rationalize it in terms of specific heat. Sometimes, even though they're trained professionally, because they're just like running all around, like in shop, they only have 30 minutes to make a dish. They just grab whatever and they put the water and they go. Let's say that we're in a cooking show, you guys, and we have to make a pasta dish. I have three different pots, copper, iron, and aluminum. I put water, the same amount of water in all of them. I turn on my stove, okay? at the same amount of heat. In the table, you have the different specific heat. Which pot is going to boil my water faster? Let's put it in the chat. Great job, exactly. Copper is going to boil my water faster because it has a lower specific heat compared to the other two materials. Okay, so understand that specific heat, it is used in cooking, it is used in construction, because sometimes the materials for a home, you need to consider the specific heat, because let's say that you live in the desert, and there's a lot of sun hitting your home, you don't want that to have low specific heat, because you want your home to just hold onto the cooling a little bit longer, and not get so hot so fast. So understand that specific heat has many um, applications. Or like, for example, when we go to the beach, when it's a hot day, like this weekend, that we're expecting temperature in three digits, right? If you go on a hot day to the beach, what's hotter, the sand or the water? Let's put it in the chat. What's hotter? The sand, right? Because the sand is going to have a lower specific heat compared to the water, okay? So that is all for today, you guys. I hope that you guys have a great weekend. 